Welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast. With me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. I did everything before I leave. I need to find that bag of my Alex Hartley took us off air in Brighton earlier this year. I'm a huge fan of Pepper. We thought we were really funny, so why doesn't everyone else think we're really funny? But it's been the longest year ever, hasn't it? She's the most relaxed captain you've ever known. You got me through my flight from Mackay to Adelaide, so thank you very much. Well, my dog is now called Judy Anderson. Oh, well, Manchester Originals aren't through to the Eliminators, so I've got to change the team. Yeah. Sophie Eccleston's the worst. It's like having a child with you when she's on tour. I don't know whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows I'm a little bit stupid. So, Polly, we had a break. We did have a bit of a break. I say a break. It was slightly interrupted by our emergency episode, um, which we did about the 100 retentions for next year. In fact, I was thinking earlier, um, on the 31st of March, when all the other places get announced, mm-hmm. I think that's the day I start Duke of Edinburgh. So we won't be able to do an emergency podcast then. Unless you get some sort of satellite phone from <laughs> Wales. Satellite. Yeah, we like <laughs> ring each other. Wales. Um, Wales. Maybe you'll see Alex Hartley there. Ooh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but yeah, there's just some stuff I want to chat through before we get to our guests. Uh-huh. In fact, today it's very exciting. The World Cup starts. Yeah. Um, I am very, very excited. The start um, of the World Cup, the first day of the World Cup is amazing. Yeah. This whole tournament stretches, stretches ahead. Out, yeah. Me. Um, and nothing's almost decided yet. So mm-hmm. I think that's something really exciting because I guess when you're halfway through, you think, okay, this team's not going to be able to make it to the semi finals now, but everything's out on the table, anything can happen. Um, and I love that. The only slight hindrance is there's been a COVID case in the Australia team. Ashley Gardiner tested positive, which sounds like quite a sad situation because the rest of the team have now uh, flown somewhere else. So she's now on her own in a hotel room far from everyone else um and so can't compete in i think the first three games maybe it's interesting i heard the night said in an interview Mm -hmm. that covid is going to affect the world cup yeah and there was that stuff about fielding with nine players or getting the bus driver to field for (laughs) you or yeah but But it could happen you know this could just be the beginning i mean if you think one person in the australia team's tested positive well, presumably they've had contact with everyone else, socialising, at training. You know, they can be as careful as they want, but within that bubble, it can spread like wildfire because they have to be so close, I suppose, when they're on tour. And that's also your support staff, that's coaches, you know, all these sort of things. So hopefully it's just the one case and everything goes as normal because, um, you know, as funny as it would be potentially, if you know, to get some random person to field, that is not the situation you want. And that would mean that a lot of people are missing out on kind of a big part of their career. And like World Cup, it's a big deal. So it would be a real shame if that got ruined for people, especially, you know, debutants or people who's this may be their last World Cup. Yes. And also if it happens to multiple teams Mm -hmm. and affects multiple matches, it actually compromises the integrity of the competition. Mm -hmm. Because you want the World Cup to say, these are the people who were at the top of their Mm -hmm. games at that period of time, all playing against each other. Yeah. And this mm-hmm. was the outcome. Yeah. And in fact, BBC have been um, putting out clips of like the best catches from the 2017 World Cup or top moments. And I've just loved watching. Um, there's some amazing catches. Like some mm-hmm. of the fielding was really good. So hopefully we'll see a bit of that um, this time. But yeah, that is just very exciting. Um, Worcestershire announced all their fixtures, the women's uh, Worcestershire Rapids. Mm-hmm. And they're playing one at Hales Owen, which is my club. So that is very exciting. Brilliant. We have to go. We're going to have to go. Um, So I'm currently doing ECB level one. What's that? So it's the four. It's actually now they changed the name. So it's called foundation one, Mm -hmm. which is my first coaching course. So I think we mentioned it a few episodes ago that Mm -hmm. I was going to do it. Um, But I started that last week. Um, I was a bit underprepared because I read the email wrong. (laughs) Typical. Um, But it was very good. You seem to have come out of it smelling of roses, so really well done. Yeah, so I just have to pass the other two. You have, like, assessments, like, practical mm-hmm. ones, and then you have to do some online stuff. So I've got to do two practical and two online. Um, and then I can coach cricket. Fantastic. Which is pretty cool. Um, so next Tuesday, heading to Lords. Um, mm-hmm. So if anyone else is 
going to the symposium on women's cricket um let me know because i need some friends <laughs> this is really exciting um, though isn't it yeah because you're you've got permission to get the day off mm-hmm. school so you're kind of representing your school there you could say that yeah <laughs> and um you're representing our podcast there mm-hmm. and uh, there are going to be some really significant and exciting people there aren't there? yeah so i've seen some of the people that are going um and then i obviously know who's speaking mm-hmm. um so that yeah, it's very exciting. I guess it's my first kind of taste of the the media journalism world sort of thing, um, which is very very exciting. A little bit nerve wracking, mm-hmm. um, and you know, making good first impressions, all these th- all these things. But no, yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah, so you're not going to burp really loudly as you walk into the uh, <laughs> I mean, the long room. room. <laughs> I'll try not. Um, so we should do some World Cup predictions. Yes. So we got people to send in their predictions of who will win, mm-hmm. uh, top run scorer, top wicket taker. Mm-hmm. So we have, unfortunately, but also realistically, mm-hmm. most people have said Australia, which I get, but also they don't they don't have to win everything. That's and true. we saw in the twenty seventeen World Cup, they didn't make the finals, mm-hmm. um, and. You know, obviously different format, but in the T20 World Cup in 2018, West Indies beat them. So honestly, anything can happen. Uh, So I would love to see another team do well. Um, The second team that people said was New Zealand, which I really agree with, like Mm. very strongly. Um, After their warm up games against India, I just think they have real depth in their squad. Um, You know, their batting lineup is looking very good. Same with the. I think their bowling's a bit weaker than their batting, but I still think. Um, I mean, the way they took down Australia is remarkable. Oh, wonderful to see. Very good. Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you'd have asked in, us in the summer mm-hmm. about the semi finalists, there yeah. are four clear teams mm-hmm. that are ahead of the rest, and New Zealand yeah. would be the sort of fifth team. Mm-hmm. So it'd be England, South Africa, Australia, India would mm-hmm. would be your semi finalists. Yeah. The possibility of New Zealand. Mm-hmm. But actually looking at it now, you'd say New Zealand, I would suggest they're going to get to the semi-final. Yeah. And yeah. so one of those other three teams mm-hmm. is going to miss out. Yeah. And they have the advantage the advantage of home soil. Of course. And I suppose also, I, I don't know how much this would affect it, but because of the COVID restrictions in New Zealand, um, the fans, most of them will be supporting New Zealand. Mm-hmm. There might be, you know, a few people from India or England who... Or Australia or whatever, who live in New Zealand. However, I would imagine the majority of people would be from New Zealand. And so first it's on home ground, but also you have home support. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, like, I wonder if there's some sort of stats and how that affects your play, but I think that is a big factor. Um, then next joint, people said England and India. I think England do stand a good chance. I'm not convinced about India actually at the moment. I feel a little bit mixed. There's something up. I mean, there was that yeah. news this week about Jeremy Rodriguez mm. being uh, sort yeah. of declassified mm. to a, a grade C uh, contract, contract. Um, and there's something really wrong there. I yeah, don't... I've been thinking about it a lot, and I definitely think there are issues and personal politics getting in the way. Mm. Um, and I think also looking at the players who haven't been selected for the World Cup, certainly. I can identify reasons why Jameen Rodriguez and Poonam Rao might be left out. Um, not, not so much shipping. Non cricketing reasons. Yes. So I don't know how, and obviously we don't know the situation, but it does seem to me that there is something going on. And especially considering, you know, when someone like Jameen Rodriguez is playing for India, she does, she is quite out of form. But as soon as you put her in, a franchise tournament she's amazing and to me like I understand that there's probably more pressure playing at international level however I think there must be something else and like I don't want to accuse anyone of anything I'm speculating but I do think there is something and I I just hope that I don't know there are good people helping especially Shika Poonam and Jemmy like I really hope there are people helping them out because it is a bit concerning and I mean you know India have just got like a sports psychologist on their team like just in the last couple of weeks for this world cup um and so I can see that people are 
being more looked after but for the people that aren't in that 15 or whatever yeah I do worry a bit so Jemmy we know you're a big fan of the pod I think if she was a big fan she would have replied to our DM to get we'd love to have you on the pod Jemmy so uh, we're reaching out to you if anybody knows Jemmy has her phone number anything please drop a message (laughs) and we really want to get her on the podcast okay um and the final team, South Africa, who I think also stand a chance. I was, like, really, really convinced. Then Jennifer Nierkirk's situation happened. Now not so sure. Also, Lizelle Lee is going to definitely miss the first game because yeah. her partner's just had a baby. So she's just flown over um, and is in quarantine at the moment. So I think she'll miss the first game, which is it's Bangladesh, I think. So not, like, you know, it's not why they're playing against Australia. Mm-hmm. However... You never know. So hopefully that will be um, all right and South Africa can kind of recover, I suppose, because they were looking so good before, I guess, different circumstances came into play. Yes. Uh, in terms of top run scorers, uh, someone did say Jemmy Rodriguez, and I was like, don't, <laughs> don't rub it in my face <laughs> even, uh, like, anymore. Um, but Amelia Kerr and Sophie Devine were the most common answers. Uh, Laura Wolvart, Lizelle Lee, Meg Lanning, Natalie Raj... Nat Siver, Tammy Beaumont and Tali McGrath, which I mean, I would agree with all of them. Um, and considering quite a few of them are openers, you would really hope so. Um, yeah, I, I think to be a top one scorer, you've really got to bat in the top three, I would suggest, yeah. because you're maximising your overs. Mm-hmm. So Tali McGrath, I think, comes in five or six. Yeah, similar so, with Nat Siver. Uh, so that may be a disadvantage because mm-hmm. there are fewer overs to bat through. Yeah. You know? So theoretically, you could bat for 50 overs mm-hmm. and... and and, you know, and get a, a, a huge hundred. Yeah. Um, whereas if you're only coming in in the 30th over, then you're somewhat restricted, mm-hmm. aren't you? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, they're all top players, aren't yeah. they? And there'll be players that emerge that we're not mm-hmm. even talking exactly. about. Exactly. And I think especially with, so teams such as Bangladesh and Pakistan, especially, I don't know many of the players. Yeah. And these tournaments are so important for like getting to know players. Mm-hmm. And suddenly we will have household names from those teams. Mm. I think similarly with West Indies as well, because they haven't played England that recently. I think they played them in 2020 during mm. COVID. But obviously because you can go to the game, stuff like that, mm. a bit different. Um, but I'm yeah, I'm really, really excited. And also like getting a bit of a preview for South Africa. So obviously they're playing England, but then also most of these teams will be playing in the Commonwealth Games. So again, another good preview to see. Um, top wicket takers, the top one was Kate Cross, which I think comes from favouritism. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, she's been really informed and she's a great cricketer, but she's less of a wicket taker than someone else who's on here, like Catherine Brunt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really excited to see Catherine Brunt. Just, I love watching her play. Um, Darcy Brown on there again, yeah. just really... It, this is what scares me about Australia. Like, their young talent is remarkable. And to think... You know, she's been nominated by, I'm saying nominated, you know, someone said, I think she's going to be the top wicket taker at her age, I think just speaks volumes. Yeah. Uh, Sophie Eccleston, again, agree, like you just can't be Sophie Eccleston. Uh, Julan Goswami, I mean, I love Julan and I just think she, she'll she take loads of wickets. She was up until England won the World Cup final. Yeah. She was the standout player was, in that yeah, match. Yeah, 100%. Me. Yeah. Uh, she was so terrifying compared <laughs> to all the other bowlers. And we really struggled against mm-hmm. her. Yeah. Um, what a what a player. And, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, you know, like Catherine Brunt, mm. like Jimmy Anderson, yeah. she just keeps up keeps on exactly. going and gets better. Yeah. I think there has to be some sort of pact between Julian Goswami, Catherine Brunt and Jimmy Anderson that they all retire at the same time <laughs> because just, but when they do retire in my head, cricket just won't work mm-hmm. anymore. Like it just won't exist. But I guess we'll see that with Jimmy Anderson in the West Indies. Mm-hmm. Won't get into that. Um, but also Marazan Cap and Tali McGrath, again, like scary bowlers. Yes. Um, I would not want Marazan Cap bowling at me. Um but yeah, it's looking very, very good ahead of the World Cup. And I'm very excited. And hopefully people in New Zealand are excited because obviously we don't really know what it's like there in terms of, I know COVID's bad, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I think there's a capacity, it's like 10% capacity at grounds, okay. which 
I think they were going to try and change and have an exception for the tournament, but I don't think that's happened. So They've been really strict, haven't they? Yeah, which is understandable. However, <laughs> it is a bit frustrating because World Cups are about everyone from all over the world, you know, mm-hmm. coming together and like all the games are like, I don't know, celebrations and yeah, we'll see. But um, yeah, I'm hoping it's good. But we've got guests today. We do. In fact, we recorded this, I think, at the start of the Ashes. Mm-hmm. Um, so we spoke to Sue Redfern, who is going to be umpiring in this World Cup. She is. Her first game, I think, is India against Pakistan. Yeah. Um, and Sue is just a bit of a legend, isn't she? Well, yes. She's <laughs> so good at yeah. what she does. I'm, the decisions that she makes, just with her, with her eyes, mm-hmm. with a split second to decide, are yeah. just extraordinary. Yeah, I don't think I could do it because especially, you know, at international level, there's a lot more scrutiny mm-hmm. of the umpires. And I mean, luckily they, they've got DRS mm-hmm. um, for all the games, which we found out early in the week. Um, so that, that'll be really, really good because I don't think for all the 2017 games there was right. DRS. I think it was only some of them, which yeah. I guess you could argue is a bit unfair. But um, yeah, I'm very, very excited to, to see Sue out on the field because... In Sue, we trust. She is a very good umpire, and she was great to talk to. Yeah, and, you know things like, uh, you know, she played for England in mm-hmm. the days when it was all that matter. Yeah, and so she's never been paid to play mm-hmm. cricket, and now yeah. she's an umpire, a top umpire. Yeah, but she's not paid for that. Exactly, either. she's not professional. So yeah, she was great to talk to. So shall we go upstairs with Sue because we've got a review. <laughs> Sue, thank you oh, so crikey. much. No, it's absolutely fine. On our podcast. This is this is brilliant of you. We're so <laughs> thrilled. I don't normally well, get well. dressed up so posh, actually. <laughs> um, so now I feel underdressed, if I'm being <laughs> totally honest. So uh, a little bit work. worried about that now. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the, the BBC where I used to wear dinner jackets to, to read the news. And, um, brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant. It's, it's, it's great to see you. How, how's, how's your daily? What do cricket umpires do during the winter? Uh, so I'm I'm not a full time cricket umpire. I have a full time job. So oh, wow. uh, yeah. So literally, uh, I'm I'm being kept very busy in my day job. If I'm being totally honest, uh, just come back from an extended Christmas break, uh, and uh, yeah, keeping uh, very busy with the day job. So uh, yeah, kind of like most cricket umpires, probably just recharge, refuel, have a bit of uh, you know T, uh, TLC time. Uh, but yeah, back to a full time job. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. So, yeah. So, um, are there, so I guess there are full time umpires in the game, aren't there? So, is there, yes. a, yep. is there a possibility you could become one of them in the future? Is that, or actually, are you very happy with the day job? Uh, I, this is where I get myself into lots of trouble, Richard. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I love my day job, absolutely yeah. love my day job, and I'm very lucky. I work in cricket. Uh, and you know I'm given the time off which is fantastic uh, but absolutely my aspiration and ambition would be to be a professional umpire with without doubt uh, you know so uh, is there a, is there an opportunity in the future who knows that's that's out of my control uh, do I think there should be uh, pathways for females to, to do whatever they want in cricket yeah absolutely there should be pathways and opportunities uh, but but that is totally out of my control but yeah absolutely my aspiration is to be a professional umpire so going all the way back um obviously you played cricket for england how did yes. you get involved in cricket in the first place <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm I'm a real cricket tragic. Uh, one would say it was already aligned in the stars. Uh, yeah, kind of like it feels such a long time ago. So, you know, I feel like a completely different person to, to when I was playing cricket for England. Uh, you know, it's over 20 years ago now, so I'm feeling very old. Uh, but uh, yeah, how did I get involved? So uh, mum and dad uh, were really supportive. Uh, I've got an older brother, a couple of years older than me, uh, who was a cricket badger as well. Uh, and uh, basically, 
recently, a uh, brother played, my dad played a little bit of cricket, played county second 11 cricket when he was growing up, was a bit of a cricket umpire as well in the local leagues in Nottinghamshire. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, as, as children, we were just really lucky. We had sporty parents so who just supported us in whatever choices we made. Uh, I think my mum said to me, you can play any sport you want, but you're not playing rugby. Uh, so I think that was the only, uh, you know, the only thing I wasn't allowed to do. Uh, so uh, as a kid, I kind of like tried lots of sports uh, when I was growing up in my early teens. Uh, my main sports were swimming and badminton. Uh, and then at 16, I had to make a choice. I played a little bit of cricket uh, since I was about nine. I played some women's cricket from 13. And at 16, I had to make a choice uh, between uh, a scholarship to America for badminton or continuing my cricket. So literally uh, the choice was cricket. Uh, but don't regret it. You know, you can't have any regrets in life. And uh, I just feel really lucky where cricket's taken me and where, where it's uh, given me opportunities, both in playing, officiating and working, really. So, uh, yeah, just uh, feel very lucky and very privileged. And across your cricket career, you got to play some pretty amazing games, you know, World Cup. What is the best game that you have ever played in? Yeah, uh, great questions. Uh, so probably... For, for me, probably on a personal level, uh, in 97, we played South Africa in a home series. Uh, and for me, it was probably I was bowling my best I've ever bowled. Uh, and it was just personally a really strong series for me. I, I won player of the series. Uh, so it would have to be uh, for me on a personal performance level, uh, the, the one day international at Bristol where I got my best bowling figures. Uh, the downside to that is I missed out on a fiver because I couldn't catch. I missed out on bold. So I can only blame myself for that, can't I really? I can't really blame anyone else for that one. Uh, and, and yeah, I suppose that for me sticks out as one of the uh, the main games. And then I suppose my last one day international, uh, for a couple of reasons, just an emotional, it, my last one day international was against India at Trent Bridge, which is obviously, you know, my home county. So to play at Trent Bridge was, you know, really special. I'd never had the opportunity before. Um, uh, and I, I bowled really badly, kind of like I think, you know, kind of like from, from memory, uh, but I wasn't known for batting at that point. And, uh, you know, I, th I think I got elevated up the order uh, because we, we were having a bit of a batting collapse. Uh, I walked out to the middle and my captain was batting and she said, what are you doing here? You're not in this batting order at this point. And I was like, well, you know, I'm ready to play. And, you know, kind of like I was instrumental, I think, in helping uh, turn that game around and, and we beat a strong Indian team. So, you know, I feel really proud of uh, my contribution in the batting lineup on that. And that's something I'll remember forever. So, yeah. And I'm interested in what it was like to play, I guess, in the era before professionalism. And what was it like to go on tours? And I suppose, how much did you have to self-fund and things like that? Yeah, so I was probably... Uh, you know, I was probably one of the fortunate ones. It was a, a new generation uh, back in the early 90s. So uh, I got into the women's squad in 93, uh, just after they'd won the World Cup. So uh, I was in the stands cheering for England to beat New Zealand in the World Cup, uh, watching my idols uh, in the stands. Uh, and then the following month, I got selected for winter training and I'm, I'm training with these players. So I'd obviously played <laughs> with some of these players and I played against them, but certainly not from an England perspective. So it was very, you know, I was a little bit starstruck, if I'm being honest, you know, because there were some amazing players in that in that England squad and, you know, kind of like some proper role models in terms of, uh, you know, proper goats of the game, really. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so... Uh, from, from that perspective, uh, when, when I got into the squad, uh, literally, uh, we, we didn't have to pay for training. We didn't have to pay for uh, going on tour. We had to contribute some things for the tour. So things like uh, equipment costs and things like that. So I was quite lucky in the generations before. Obviously, everything was paid for by the players. Uh, but at that point, we had some minor sponsorship from the governing body and some minor other sponsors like uh, Sports Council and things like that. So, you know, uh, it was very different. Uh, we were all either in education or 
we were in employment. Uh, you know, I certainly was the youngest player when I broke into the squad in 93. Uh, and yeah, kind of like literally uh, it was, yeah, it was uh, very different uh, in terms of, you know, I had to leave uh, at that point. I had three casual jobs. Uh, so I'd just left school and, and I was working in three different jobs. And uh, obviously, whilst I was on tour, uh, I, I didn't earn. I earned no money. So I relied heavily on my mum and dad uh, in terms of finances. Uh, and obviously, there was no financial gain uh, to women's cricket at that point. So it was, you know, incredibly difficult to, you know, make a career out of it or, or you know, provide, you know, essentials, which, which you need for families. So, you know, nowadays, the opportunity to kind of like make a career of it for the players is so important for the growth of the game. And it's so important for the players themselves. So, uh, yeah, very, very different. Uh, and the tours, the tours back then as well were probably a little bit longer because we, we only played test match and one day internationals. That's how old I am. Uh, you know, I, I never played a T20, which would probably have been my preference in terms of my game. Uh, but uh, yeah, the tours, the first tour I went on to overseas really was uh, India. Uh, and we had a seven week tour. So that was quite a long, long time away from home. You know, I was, I was quite a uh, green 18 year old who'd mm -hmm. never been away from home, never been away from family. And then suddenly you're on tour with 15 other women, a couple of support staff. Uh, and the, the only thing you've got in common, you're not even the same age. The only thing you've got in common is that you love cricket. And suddenly this becomes your supporting network, your family, you know, mum and dad are trusting these adults to look after their child really in terms of uh, that tour so uh, very different experience yeah it's amazing though because it has really paved the way I suppose for the current England team who you know have just gone to Australia and actually you know everything's paid for they don't need to worry about you know jobs and things like that on the side so it's quite incredible um so yeah, who are is. some of those heroes that you spoke about who were in the England squad and um, any other role models you had growing up, either men's or women's? Yeah, so uh, obviously I've got to, got to mention my brother uh, or else uh, I'll, I'll get told <laughs> off. Uh, but no, my, my brother and my dad obviously were my cricket uh, checkpoints really when I was growing up. Uh, I spent a huge amount of time playing backyard cricket with my with my brother and going down the local park with his mates uh, playing test match cricket during the summer holidays. Uh, obviously played in local club cricket with him as well. Uh, so, you know, kind of like he was a much better cricketer than me, uh, interestingly. So, you know, I, I was just I got the lucky breaks, I guess, in terms of the opportunities. But uh, yeah, I think uh, outside of my family, uh, I think it's definitely people like Jeanette Britton, who were in that World Cup squad, uh, who unfortunately has passed away, uh, you know, for me was just uh, the, you know, the absolute role model, you know, in terms of how she went around the role she went around, the responsibility of it, the determination, the, the grit and resilience, uh, and just really her skill sets as well. Just, you know, she had a really, a really strong game uh, and uh, that that was quite special. And it was, you know, there was a little bit of cheekiness in there as well in the fact that she wouldn't always conform, uh, which I quite like because she would probably challenge and, and that's good. Uh, you know, uh, so I think she definitely kind of like helped develop and progress the game and evolve it. Uh, and then obviously you've got people, uh, I was fortunate, I, uh, in, in those days when I was playing, the county equivalent uh, was re more regional. So I was playing for like East Midlands ladies uh, and we were playing kind of like uh, some counties were in existence like Yorkshire and teams like that. And we, you know, in my East Midlands team, I was actually playing alongside Karen Smithies, Jane Smith uh, and Joe Chamberlain, Wendy Watson, who were all in that team. Uh, so, you know, I was very lucky in that respect you know, that, that I knew those guys already. Uh, you know, you, you again, the determination of Karen Smith is to, to win that World Cup and a captaincy. Uh, you know, we didn't always see eye to eye, but kind of like ultimately she, you know, was a strong leader and, and, and a determined leader. And then you've got people like Joe Chamberlain, obviously, as a fast bowler. You know, I was medium fast, but she was a fast bowler. She opened the bowling with me. Uh, you know, she, absolutely kind of like who I wanted to be, really, in terms of the pace, in terms of the ability, uh, her thought into the game. Uh, so, so yeah, and then uh, I think as a, as a kid growing up watching the game outside of women's cricket, uh, 
Uh, I think, you know, for me, because I was a medium fast bowler, I always wanted to be over six foot tall and bowl like the West Indies fast bowlers. Uh, it never came to, to transition, but, you know, that's the, that, that for me was the real excitement was to see kind of like fast bowlers. And it's something I really enjoy to see a proper fast bowler. Uh, you know, I'm left arm, I'm a left arm medium uh, fast. And, you know, to see that uh, is pure beauty, really. I think sometimes we, we over, you know, kind of like the, the, the emphasis is really on the batting a lot whereas kind of like bowlers you know are kind of like they work hard and and can change games and you know kind of like just a great example of that was some of the best bowling I've seen recently is Marizan Cap in the 100 final mm-hmm. uh, that bell, that spell of fast bowling was quite special to watch and I was very fortunate that I was at that end umpiring uh, watching <laughs> that and it was just a really special uh, special thing to watch because it was a, a, an outstanding piece of fast bowling the best view in the house that's uh, yeah that's definitely <laughs> definitely and that, that you know that's that's what you know that's the joy of this job you know kind of like as an ex-player there's nothing like playing you know that's that's you know I, I feel very privileged that I've played cricket for England mm-hmm. and I've played cricket but you know this is this is great you know you do get the best seat in the house and you still get the ability to kind of like soak up that atmosphere the adrenaline on the pitch and to see the cricket to see the quality cricket and you know something more special for me is to see the evolution of women's cricket it has been mm. so exciting and so you know it's quite it was quite emotional the 100 particularly for me was a very emotional period so yeah yeah do you is part of you slightly jealous that that didn't happen in your era and that you've kind of had to you know scrimp your way through and you know and you maybe sort of finish your international career sooner than you would have if, if the opportunities had had been there is yeah part, sort of slightly jealous of this generation Oh, 100% jealous, but at the same time, uh, 100% jealous, but at the same time, I uh, feel quite proud because I think, you know, kind of like without people leading the way for me to have my opportunities in the past, you know, these people wouldn't have those opportunities. So we're all part of the history and the growth of women's cricket, and I feel quite proud of that. Uh, but but on the flip side, Richard, I might not have got in the England team now. So, you know, I'm lucky I was in the generation where I got in the England team. So, you know, I, I think, you know, from that perspective, it swings in roundabouts. And I I suppose, you know, kind of like you look at, you know, there are certain players through history who, you know, you could probably can compare to today's uh, quality of cricket to somebody like Catherine Fitzpatrick, you know, from Australia, who I think would still perform in in today's climate. She was a good enough bowler and there are a number of people, you know, who are like that. And and I'm certainly not one of those people. I was an average cricketer. So, uh, yeah, kind of like there are definitely people who could, you know, transcend uh, those generations for sure. And talk us through your umpiring journey and how you kind of went from never umpiring to umpiring in international games. Uh, yeah, it all happened quite quick, didn't it? Uh, so uh, back uh, back in 2012, I decided I would stop playing cricket. I was playing club cricket, a bit of county cricket. And uh, I just, you know, I got to the point where I wasn't enjoying the game anymore. I wasn't enjoying playing. My body was taking quite a lot of time to recover. Uh, and it was time to hang up my boots. It was, you know, something that I felt quite strongly about that I'd finished with my playing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought long and hard because I work in cricket as a full time job. Uh, and I thought, well, is that enough or do I want more and do I want to put more back in? And uh, my decision was that I still wanted to be involved uh, in cricket, in the cricket playing, because my role within uh, cricket isn't necessarily the field in- involved in the game. Uh, and uh, really, I was like, should I coach? No, not really. That's not really me. It's not something that I've really enjoyed in the past. It's, you know, kind of like it's not something I want to progress. Do I want to score? I used to score as a kid and I'm like, well, I enjoy it, but no, not really. Uh, do I want to umpire? So conversation with my dad, who was an ex-umpire, and I said, look, you know, kind of like, do you, do you think I could do this? Do you think, you know, and he said, well, do your qualifications, see what you think, go and umpire, sure you could do it. And I went along to my local county association, uh, got no connections in, in the West Midlands because I, I, I don't really, I, I grew up playing my cricket in the East Midlands. So I went along to Warwickshire and literally uh, kind of like did the 13 week course then uh, every Monday night in a very cold stadium, uh, went through law one all the way through the law book uh, and uh, yeah, understood the laws for the first time ever. Kind of like I'd never understood the laws of cricket. There was so much stuff which I didn't know and I learned. I was like, wow, if I had known this stuff as a player, I think I'd have been a better player to be perfectly honest. So, uh, so yeah, 
yeah and then at, at the end of that course it was probably early april it finished uh, and uh, they said oh what are you going to do with it so you've got your qualification what are you going to do next and i was like well i don't really know where to umpire in this area and they said we'll put you in the panel if you want and you can umpire men's local men's club cricket and i was like yeah that's cool uh, so first saturday of the season off i went to random cricket club uh, didn't know who my colleague was no knew none of my colleagues uh, literally got to the ground uh, got uh, kind of like walked up and they said oh you're the scorer no I'm your umpire so that was my first experience of umpiring uh, which was interesting uh, and then uh, got onto the field spoke with a colleague can't nice chap kind of like no, you know nothing uh, out of the ordinary kind of like I took the first over just it was through luck because you know you you, you, you can't determine which end you're going to start from uh, and uh, kind of like I was like I've got no idea what men's cricket is like these days kind of like last time I saw men's cricket was about 20 years ago I've got no idea what this standard is going to be like and I'm standing at the end going well I know the laws now but I actually don't know how to umpire so that was my first kind of like fear was like oh crikey I actually don't know what to do as an umpire so you know kind of like the first ball came through and it was like to be fair, it wasn't the fastest delivery I've ever seen. Uh, and the batter completely missed it and got clean bowled. And I was like, wow, OK. Uh, and I think there was 62 all out and I was home by three o'clock. So it was an interesting first day. But after that first match, I was like, do you know what? I need to actually read up a little bit more and find out a little bit more about how to be an umpire. Because I've been around cricket for so long, but I'd never really looked at an umpire. I'd never really understood what they did and how they moved and what their role was in the game. and it, it's a very different now I've, I've done so much umpiring it's a very different experience it's a very different way to look at the game uh, so I was watching the wrong things when I started umpiring so I suppose for the first couple of years you're learning your craft and then as it transpired a women's world cup was coming up in 2017 and uh, you know internally within cricket we were talking about how we're going to kind of like improve gender and improve diversity within the game have we got any female umpires and it transpired that you know I was one of very few female umpires at that point who umpired in in cricket in Premier League cricket or any, anything really uh, which was really disturbing at that point and I think it's something that you know we definitely need to address we need more female officials more official more females in different roles uh, and, and I was given the opportunity and uh, since then I've, I've never really looked back and you know I've, I've been given great opportunities and I'm I'm really really uh, humbled by that and I feel very fortunate and privileged so yeah that's that's pretty much my journey. I'm interested as a player did you ever give umpires a hard time? Did you like show dissent and were you naughty? Obviously, I'm going to say no. <laughs> I was, I was a, I was a bowler, Richard. I was a fast bowler. <laughs> okay, say no more then. Say no more. So, and and to add to that, I was a left arm over fast bowler who was never successful in LBWs. Uh, you know, which is now obviously with the introduction of DRS, it's been proven that yes. you can you can be out LBW off a left arm over bowler. So, uh, so, so yeah, I was probably I got told off a lot as as a player uh, for running down the wicket. Uh, and, and I now understand, uh, kind of like from an umpire's perspective, how uh, frustrating that can be in terms of like damaging the wicket and things. So, uh, yeah, you definitely see it from a different perspective. But, uh, yeah, I always I always like to think I stayed on the humorous side of challenging decisions. Uh, maybe the umpires would think different. What's the most like niche law you've ever had to apply in a game? Oh, crikey. Uh, the most niche law. I think uh, there was a game, uh, men's cricket, uh, league cricket. Uh, there was a game where literally, uh, girl, so, sorry, it was a women's game. So it was women's league, uh, women's league cricket. Uh, girl was fielding at, at uh, cover. Uh, and uh, batter uh, hit it out to a kind of like the girl dived and the way she dived to catch it, it was uh, she rolled and and it was and it was very it, it was very difficult to tell whether she grounded it or not. Kind of like and literally uh, kind of like the player started running off, just assuming she'd been caught. And then suddenly she the player rolled over on the ground and it was clear that the ball had been 
grounded. But now the pl- the batter was almost halfway off to the pavilion, and it was like, oh crikey, the ball's still live. She could be run out. Uh, she could be run out here because the ball's still live. So I had to basically just shout dead ball, uh, and they were like, well, what are you doing? And it was like going, she's under the apprehension that she's out, so therefore she's protected and she shouldn't be out. It's not fair if she's under the apprehension she's been out, you know that that she should be out really. So literally, kind of like had to just call that dead ball, which is a slight kind of like uh, nuance of the the laws really. So yeah, that would probably be the weirdest one. Yeah, because that was that incident in the hundred, wasn't that in the men's game? No, it was the I think it was the T Twenty Blast final oh, where yes. it was the either it was caught on the boundary or yeah. it was a six. Yeah, so so that's a really bizarre part of the law, and and you know maybe it gets changed in the next revision. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't I don't know. I'm not the lawmaker, but uh, that was where because the fielder the fielder compl- uh, a fielder collided with another fielder whilst catching the ball, and that fielder therefore was touching the boundary who mm-hmm. wasn't catching the ball. So the mm-hmm. question is because if the catcher is touching another fielder who's over the boundary, should that catch stand or not? And and the answer is kind of like only if uh, basically the fielder who wasn't catching the ball only matters if they were deliberately helping that catcher. Mm -hmm. And actually that, that it didn't, it hindered. So hence the reason why uh, obviously kind of like the decision should have been kind of like out, not, not out, if that makes sense. Yeah, we spoke to Anna Harris oh, a really, like a yeah. few weeks after it happened. And I think she was explaining yeah. that like the ICC had a slightly different rule to uh, the MCC, the MCC yeah. or something like that. Yeah. You thought it was yeah. interesting. Yeah, so the law of cricket, I think if, I think I'm right in that. In the law of cricket, basically says kind of like if you know it only it only matters if the fielder is deliberately helping and supporting. There's mm-hmm. there's a word in the law, but you know kind of like as an umpire, I think you know one of the hardest things is because uh, we've got laws of cricket, but because there's so many different types of cricket like T20, ODIs, uh, you know Test match cricket, there's regulations for each competition. And, and obviously there are changes to the laws. So as a cricket umpire, you know, before a match, you're having to kind of like learn the regulations of that of that tournament, of that match, uh, which is, you know, kind of like preparation work, really. And that's hugely complex, isn't it? Especially as, as I guess, during be. the summer, you're, you're flitting from one to another almost on a day by day basis. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I think, you know, on average in a season, you're probably reading something in excess of 20 different regulations, you know, and, and I always have a rule because I don't have a memory bank large enough to remember. Uh, so I always have a rule that I'll only ever read a regulation when it's the next match. Uh, so, you know, pre-season, if I know it's a tournament that I'm going to be doing quite regular, you know, you do your preparation work and you do your crib cards. So I carry a crib card on field of the major changes. So it, it doesn't trip me up when I'm on field. But, uh, you know, I like to reread the regulations before the game starts so you know kind of like there's there's different ones there's different uh you know there's different ways you deal with ground weather light different ways you deal with some on-field stuff penalties for over eights uh so lots of things change uh some of some of the regulations uh so some of the regulations i have to read are over 100 pages long uh so obviously kind of like there's a bit of prep work involved in that as well and speaking about Anna Harris, um, I was there where she made her kind of half debut um, as an international umpire. Worcester. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, and, I was there too. Yeah, and I think, I, I don't know how many people in the crowd knew that it was her debut. I was very, very excited. Um, yep. But for you, I guess, as a female umpire, how good was it seeing another female umpire making a debut, especially one at only like age 22, I think? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, definitely a long time coming, as I've said, with regards to kind of like I was really disappointed leading up to that 217 World Cup that we didn't have many female umpires, you know, who who were umpiring, really. And I, and I think it's so important to kind of like have a number of female umpires. I'm really pleased and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that, you know, there was 10 of us involved in the women's hundred and, and two, Anna and uh, Sarah Bartlett, uh, went on to do some international experience as well. And that's really important for the game it's really important for us in England obviously there are other countries who also have other female umpires who are developing and growing and it's important that we keep pace and set the pace really in some cases because of our player numbers you know it's really important that we you know kind of like keep encouraging and keep promoting females in different roles. 
I'm, I'm interested if I'd asked Anna this question when we talked to her and I'm interested yeah. in your take on it about your relationship with the players uh, and how I don't know how you talk to the players how matey you are with them uh, on a, a, during a match or, or is that a problem when you sort of know the players on one side a lot better than you know the players on the other side yeah I think you know for me over the years I've been umpiring I think now I've got you know whether right or wrong my style uh, I've tried to you know I, I struggled a couple of years ago with kind of like how to in- interact with players I came across as quite assertive as quite serious mm-hmm. and I think from my perspective I really took a look at my umpiring and for me what works for me best is I umpire best when I'm enjoying it I umpire best when I'm relaxed and you know kind of I don't want to get too involved with the players and I think that's important that you know they've got a job to do I've got a job to do but there's ways in which you do it and it's your own personal st- style so there's no right or wrong way uh, I think you know for me it's kind of like you know if I if players want to talk to me I'm happy to talk you know that's part of my you know kind of like my routine uh, and I think you know what is important is you know if I'm saying something which is game critical I'm providing fair and equal opportunities to both teams you know so mm-hmm. that's important and you know kind of like from my perspective you know whatever's happening socially it's important that obviously my decision making is still process driven and, and fair so mm-hmm. yeah that's really important and I think you know that comes across in terms of kind of like how I carry myself how I talk yeah there's going to be different people there's going you know we're, we're, it's walks of life isn't it you get on with different people you know so uh, but the key thing for me is you know my umpiring style now I want to come across that I'm enjoying the game and I think over the last couple of years I think I've improved on that uh, mm-hmm. and people are you know have commented that they you know they can see that I'm enjoying that time out in the middle and, and why wouldn't I you know I've got the best seat in the house I've got the <laughs> one of the best jobs in the world so you know from my perspective why not enjoy it and you know for me that helps with keeping me calm and keeping that pressure down really because there are some times where as an umpire you are under pressure just like as a player uh you know you do have those pressure points so it's important you stay grounded and and come up with some tactics yeah absolutely and i i again i think that if i were an umpire which i'm not (laughs) but the thing i would find so difficult would be having to make an instant decision and, and not show hesitation in that decision too much as well, because it kind of undermines the decision when you do that, doesn't yeah. it? And, and, yeah. and actually, you've literally got, you know, two seconds maximum, really, haven't you? Do you have to sort yeah, of train yourself to do that? Or is it is an instant it's, thing? So, so the way I would describe cricket umpiring is literally, it's all about process. It's all about you know kind of like probably being like an elastic band you know you stretch it but come back and it's kind of like you repeat the activity you know so effectively you do the same on every delivery and it's the same process so if your processes are strong and you know kind of like from a cricket umpire we all we'll all have different ways of doing things uh, but our processes will be different but as long as each ball I'm I'm consistent then obviously that helps me make those decisions and it and it doesn't put me into an environment where I suddenly become startled and then make a panic decision and and that's not where we want to be so what I aim for is a good example on LBWs is probably the obvious one you know when an LBW decision comes in and there's an appeal I'm really not interested how they're appealing you know it's an appeal I'm going through the same process but I'm also trying to time it in the same way so I you know even if I think it's plum I'm trying to slow down my decision because I'm still asking the same questions in my head about whether or not this is out than what it would be if it was a tight decision you know so the process is the same so I'm hopefully pacing my decisions and I'm not too quick because then it's obviously kind of like the perception might be that I'm not giving due thought to that and the batter might get a little bit cheesed with that if I'm not giving due thought and I've given it out or the bowler might not be happy that I've just dismissed them straight away in terms of their appeal so you know not being too quick is really important but on the flip side you're absolutely right Richard if you if you leave it too long then obviously there's doubt isn't there but there's perception that there's doubt in your decision making so it's really getting that balance right in terms of kind of like that process and I suppose you know it's one thing I've learned over time is you know the more experience you have in umpiring so you know like I said earlier I came from playing I played for 25 years you know but you see the game differently as an umpire you've got different things that you need to do you need to focus on different things uh, and I think with experience in umpiring you know I think I've done over like 300 games now you know you get into a routine and you get into a process now where it becomes quite natural and it becomes easier to you know what 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 the key thing is for me is I buy myself time 
uh, because I don't have to do certain things and, and that comes with experience and, and practicing things and trying different things. So I think that's really important. Is, is DRS your friend or your enemy? Uh, I like DRS. Uh, so uh, the way uh, I know Anna frames it differently, uh, but the way I see DRS is, you know, for me uh, as a player, if I look back as an ex player, kind of like I would have probably reviewed a lot of decisions that went against me, you know, and, and the key thing is as an umpire, all I want to do is make sure that game is played fairly and, and the game is progressing as it should be. So if I've made an error or a perceived error that isn't rectified, then obviously the, the game has changed. You know, we all make errors. That's that's a fact of life. As an umpire, you make errors uh, just as you do as a player. But, you know, the DRS allows errors, obvious errors to be overturned. And, and that's important because then you can just get on with the game as it should have been and should have been. So I see that as a real positive. And I see that as, you know, from from my personal development perspective, it gives you immediate feedback. And, you know, from that perspective, it tells me whether I was right or wrong or I could have been right or wrong. And it helps me then to make future decisions. And it helps me then to think about, oh, actually, this is something I need to develop and something I need to improve. You know, so it gives you that instant feedback and that instant opportunity to reflect and review. So I think it's my my friend. Yeah. And sometimes I'm on the wrong end of it. Sometimes I get overturns. But like I say, we all make errors and, you know, kind of like the, the key thing for me is not to keep making the same errors. It's about learning from those errors. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it's, it's an impossible job. And I think I'm amazed how often umpires get it right, really, because <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's, it's really, really difficult. And I was thinking of uh, yeah. Paul Rifle last week in the test match um, when he, he gave Stokes out either LBW or caught behind when it should actually hit the wicket. It's like, how, how on earth was he ever to have known that? It, it was it, and, just impossible. And we don't know, yeah, and we don't know kind of like what, what was happening at that time, you know, kind of like for me, some of my some of my errors, some of my decisions that have been overturned have been my eyes weren't in the right place at the right time. I might have been slightly distracted or, or not focused, you know, so, you know, from that perspective, I might, you know, I, I definitely uh, last year, had a period where I was missing certain LBW decisions. So it was about actually just reflecting and thinking around, okay, why am I keeping making the same errors? So then you go through a series of like, what are my processes? What am I looking at? What's my theory? And, and why is my theory wrong? And what do I need to do differently? And, you know, that helps with the video footage, which you get, it helps, helps you to improve. So yeah, definitely. And on the field, who are, I guess some of the best female players that like chatting to you and who who are like the funniest where maybe they're not chatting to you but you just pick up stuff from around you I couldn't possibly say but uh, there are some individuals who are either cheeky cheeking their decision in their in their appeals or things like that uh, there are some players who uh, have some uh, unique styles on the field and yeah there's some players to look out for in terms of kind of like you you can see you know certain players starting to get frustrated with certain things so you can pick that up and it's you know kind of like what you know do we need to say anything do we need to do anything to maybe you know uh detract you know from potentially what's going to happen moving forward so yeah there's there are some there are some talkers on the field uh that you know who like to have a chat uh which which is nice uh uh yeah kind of like i think i got caught on stump mike uh this year in the test match having a, having a long conversation with tammy beaumont so yeah i think that was uh quite infamous really there was a bit of a chit chat on that uh so uh so yeah so there are different players who who like you know the key for me is you know like i say we We've all got jobs to do, but you know why not enjoy it whilst you're out there? Yeah, my we were at the final day of the test match actually at uh, at Bristol, which was just an amazing occasion. I thought yep. it was absolutely brilliant. But my yep. memory, my memory of that was about India trying to smuggle water onto the pitch. <laughs> to <try> and, <laughs> and, uh, and and I think it's Catherine Brunt who was like, "Excuse me, I'm the one bowling." <laughs> So I, I, I can't remember whether it was you or the other umpire just uh, sent them back sharpish with um, the flea in their ear. Yeah, uh, you know, 
yeah, players, you know, kind of like everyone's got a job to do and everyone's trying to win, aren't they? So, you know, there are times where, you know, we might have to have a little bit of a harsh word or a, a strong mm-hmm. word. But, you know, kind of like from my perspective, as soon as we, you know, you move on, don't you? You move on to the next thing. And I think, you know, Simon Tyrefall once said, you know, kind of like the important thing about umpiring is staying in the moment. And I think that's a really important facet because you can get really distracted really easy. Uh, so, yeah, kind of like it, it really is important that, you know, kind of like you, you just focus focus on what you need to focus on at the right time and probably one of the best things you umpired in this summer was the 100 what was it like from your perspective it it was like no other tournaments I've ever been involved in Polly it was just uh it was a four-week period uh and it was just literally, uh, it was just mind blowing in terms of I, you know, I'll be the first to admit I was quite skeptical about the format. I was a little bit nervous about the format, whether or not we needed it, what what it would mean, and you know how it would go. Uh, I had a couple of warm up games leading into the tournament. Uh, then got the phone call to say that I was going to be umpiring the first game. Uh, I honestly can tell you I've never been so nervous uh, leading up to a game I think the game started at 6 30 in the evening uh, I was awake at like nine uh, in the morning and uh, my nerves I could just feel my nerves getting more and more as the hours went on and you know uh, because there was so much there's so much at stake with a new format you know uh, new tournaments uh, the amount of money that was put into the tournament obviously is is well known uh, and you know kind of like uh, I think there was a lot of pressure uh, uh, and there were meetings leading up into that game. I think I was at the ground four hours before the start of the game, which is unheard of. Uh, and, you know, you're sitting as a group four hours before a game and the only thing you're going to get is nervous, you know. So it was about managing those nerves. Uh, and in all the meetings which we had in the lead up to that game, nobody told us there would be fireworks going off when we walked out onto the pitch. <laughs> Not one person thought that that would be important to mention that. So, you know, kind of like that also created a few heartbeats. Uh, and I just remember, I just remember I was at the Boulders end, I think, for the first over. And I just remember literally uh, Georgia Boyce was batting and she 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 walked into the end and she looked terrible. She, you know, and, and Georgia won't mind me saying this. She looked absolutely dreadful. And I was shaking. So, you know, kind of like my hands were shaking because I was so nervous. Georgia looked at me and she must have seen I looked dreadful. And she went are you nervous and I went Georgia I'm really nervous and, and she's just like I am as well and I was like okay and I said but at the end of it it's just a game of cricket isn't it and you know she went off and hit her first ball for four I think uh you know I called play and you know as soon as as soon as it's audible and as soon as you call play you know I, I seem to get rid of my nerves you know and I, and I think you know from that perspective it was just the, the lead into it was the most nerve-wracking but during that game it was really important somebody said to me just make sure you have an opportunity during the game to just stop and reflect and look around and actually just experience it. And, and it was only, I think it was in the last over of the game. uh, I was at the uh, square leg in the last over. They needed something like 12 of the last five. Uh, or, or at 20 I don't know how many I can't remember but uh, I remember walking off to square leg thinking oh you know I can actually just have a look round now and actually review and reflect on this and it was at that point I think it was 13,000 17,000 however many were in the ground uh, and for me it was the most emotional moment uh, I was actually I was actually in tears at square leg and I don't mind admitting it and uh, Jackson who was the Manchester Originals uh, player she was uh, uh, she was fielding and I think she looked at me and she said uh, are you crying and it was just like because like literally I looked around and and for me it was about you know kind of like thinking back to my playing days and what we wanted to achieve in women's cricket and how far women's cricket has come and to see that in a women's game and to see the raw emotion of the crowd willing Oval Invincibles on and to see what Dan Van was doing to win that game was just quite remarkable in terms of and then the emotion and the the noise when Danny did score and win that game was just incredible. And Danny's reaction as well uh, in terms of, you know, the winning uh, moment was just incredible. And yeah, it was just a moment that I'll never forget. And, you know, the tournament just carried on like that. It was just, you know, I thought, well, is that a one-off because it's the first game? How will it go? Double headers, will people turn up or will they just turn up for the guys' games? But no, the, the crowds just kept coming in and, you know, kind of like, it was just the buzz of it. And I think, you know, that night after the first night, we, I remember being back in the in the hotel and Manchester Originals came in and they were staying in the same hotel 
and they were, you know, they were disappointed, obviously, not to win. But all of them saw the bigger picture. They saw how important that was for women's cricket. And I think that was really heart wrenching because it just goes to show how, you know, how brilliant these players are and how much they understand their responsibility to kind of like grow the game and to grow women's cricket. And, I, you know, it was just, we just all saw the bigger picture that this isn't about a bunch of players playing in this tournament. This is about what this could do for women's cricket moving forward. Uh, and, and the tournament just carried on like that. And then obviously, you know, I think, you know, the opportunity for some of the domestic younger players to come in, the Alice Capses, to come in and do what they did was just extraordinary. It was just an extraordinary experience. And, you know, and again, having other female officials there and, you know, having uh, Sarah, Jasmine and uh, Anna on field doing DRS for the first time for those guys as well. Just for a number of reasons, that tournament was just incredible. It, it feels like it, it it progressed the game by several years, <laughs> those four Definitely. weeks. It, like yeah, everything yeah. seems to have changed uh, yeah. on the back of that, you know, and you add to that an Ashes Tour now and a World Cup defence uh, on top of it. And, and you know, things could get huge, even bigger. You know, 100 having been so successful first year, you'd expect actually second year it's, it's going to be even more so. And, um, you know, we went to the Women's World Cup final in 2017 as it, actually just because it, ticket, tickets were cheap and I really like going to Lords. So we, I saw they were available and I thought, well, let's go, let's get tickets to the final. And then of course, England. Yeah. Got there. And um, so that we loved that. That was an amazing day. Absolutely amazing. And at the end of it, you know, I remembered it, but four years later, Anya Shrubsoll was still the only England player I could tell you the name of until a, well, in fact, maybe a year ago when, when Polly said, oh, I've got this person called Kate Cross that I listen to and she's going to do it. She wants to do an interview on our podcast. I, but suddenly the game seems so much more open and marketable. So we went to the World Cup final, but then had no idea afterwards, you know, where can we see these people again or or, or who yeah. are they or anything like that. It was just it seemed inaccessible, whereas now. It, that seems totally different. It seems on an equal yeah, footing with the men's game. Absolutely. And I think two points really kind of like, first of all, that exposure, that media exposure is so important. And I think what the hundred did really well is it always said, and it did what it said it was always going to do. It was going to treat the women's game the same as the men's game. Mm -hmm. And it was going to treat their professional cricketers, it's performance cricket, and this is what we're going to do. And I think, you know, it was brilliant that the double headers happened, uh, you know, and I think that was something that may not have happened with COVID. So maybe that was the positive of COVID, not that there are any positives of COVID, uh, you know, and I think what was really important, it was that visibility and that exposure. Uh, and I think also as well, just the, the ability of the players now having contracts and more players having contracts has been something that's really advanced the game. You know, when you look at the likes of uh, Tash Farron, kind of like made it in England, was out of England, went back on a domestic contract, proved that she was able to go back into England, is now in England. You know, you look at your likes of Emily Arlott, you know, uh, playing for Central Sparks, kind of like literally the only reason she got a call up for the England squad for the test match, you know, didn't make the team but got the call up for the squad is because of performances in domestic cricket. Where was her game 12 months ago without a performance contract? You know, so kind of like literally those contracts are literally improving, radically improving the ability of cricket in the country for women and it's showing that there's a career opportunity for them which means that we can keep better players for longer and we can invest in that time they can invest in that time and improve their fitness and their skills you know to make them better cricketers and that's that's remarkable you know to where we were and you think about the time scale I mean 20 years isn't that long you know but literally contracts have been in place for the England players since 2014 and you know kind of like we've seen that improvement and I think we just need to keep putting pushing that and we need to keep breaking those ceilings you know to provide better cricketers because Australia aren't going to give up they're just going to get better and better so we need to keep the pace and, and set the pace really in, the, in that respect. Yeah it's been a massive game changer and it's it's so nice to be able to watch that unfolding um, and I just think it's going to go to even better things um, but one thing we wanted to chat to you about was No Balls the Cricket podcast because uh, as we mentioned I listened to it you listened to it um, yep. And um, we've interviewed both Kate and Alex, and they are absolute legends. How did you first find out that they were going upstairs with you every other week? 
So, so I, I do listen to the podcast uh, and I did listen to it before and I think, you know, it was quite, you know, for me, it's uh, tongue in cheek, isn't it? It's a little bit of humour uh, and it's something that kind of like if it means that, you know, I think they started off going upstairs with Alim Dar, didn't they? Kind of yeah. like it was, you know, pre, uh, but, you know, kind of like it's great because, you know, the work which those guys are doing in the media uh, are brilliant and to see Alex out in Australia doing the commentary and the men's ashes, uh, I think she's doing a brilliant job and mm. you know like I say the more the more we can have uh, kind of like different representation across the game the better the game is the richer our game is and, and I think that's really important and you know like I say the play you know Kate and Alex are our top people you know they're just really nice genuinely nice people uh, who are just loving life and you know why not and uh, yeah a bit of tongue-in-cheek and don't mind so much. Thank you so much for your time. No, so thank that's, you. That's been absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's been amazing. No problem. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Yes, and so all, yeah, all the best for your uh, for your proper job. And um, and, thank you. and then uh, yeah, hopefully we'll uh, we'll see you around at, at some matches this uh, this summer. It'll be great to uh, yeah, see that's you in great. again. Polly, you do so well booking <laughs> legends for our podcast. Yeah, I mean, this one was sneaky because I tagged her in a tweet to try and like say, do you want to come on the podcast? And to message me, she had to follow me back. So, I mean, I, I work my magic somehow. <laughs> um, but next week we have another guest. We do, yes. She might even be related to us. She might be related. We have Mary Waldron on the podcast. He plays for Ireland. She also has played football for Ireland. Um, she's played hockey as well. Not for Ireland, but... Um, she... And when we spoke to her, mm -hmm. she wasn't in Ireland. She was in Adelaide, our favourite place in Australia. Yes. And in fact, when you listen to it, a little mm -hmm. spoiler for next week, <laughs> you'll hear some tropical birds in the background. <laughs> which just make it seem yeah. even more exotic. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely looked nice and warm whilst we were very cold, which I think has been a theme over the winter for us because we've spoken to quite a few Aussies. Um, but yeah, come back next week for our chat with Mary because you don't want to miss it because, as we say, we might be related. Um, but you can follow us on Twitter, which is OO Child Podcast, where we're doing um, 31 days of inspirational women in cricket for um, Women's History Month. That's brilliant. So we've come up with 31 people. Um, well, to be fair, it's actually more than that, but 31 days of different people who have made a difference in cricket for whatever reason. Um, so you can obviously follow us on Twitter. Our Instagram, YouTube and TikTok are all Naughty Child Podcasts, so you can stay up to date with us on there. And get in touch and let us know what you're thinking about the World Cup. Um, and we will be tweeting loads around the World Cup. So again follow us on twitter it's a good place to be and we'll see you next week <laughs>